because of my faith in God, I realize that for freedom, you must pay a great price. No, we only pray that God would take care of our enemies. Sadly, we don't expect this specimen to survive another year. And make us strong to pray for them. Healers and midwives were a part of the transatlantic passage way. When they were here during enslavements, they were also considered very important members of the community. Even folks who were enslaving us would hire Black or African midwives. The midwife wasn't always just for catching the baby. The midwife was also the only person who knew anything about healthcare. There's ancestral knowledge and there was also generational training. Someone's mother taught their child, and that child then grew up, and that was how midwifery was passed on. My name is Efe. I'm a Black midwife, a traditional midwifery apprentice, born in Lafayette, Louisiana, raised in Houston, Texas. I didn't know what a midwife was. I didn't know what a birth worker was before I entered the profession in that capacity. I remember calling my father. I was like, I got into midwifery school, and that's when he told me that his mother was also a midwife. The OBGYN created this pathway called Nurses, and nurses at that time were assistants of OBGYNs. They were white women who went out to surveillance the grand midwives to report that they were practicing illegal midwifery. I grew up right on the edge of a time in the late 50s and early 60s where doctors were taking the business of birthing out of the hands of midwives. Where I came from in New Orleans, when a baby was born, it was the business of all the women. The midwife who had been a part of the whole gestation process would deliver the baby, and then the women in that community would take care of the household of the woman who had delivered. And this caretaking was under the direction of the midwife. I was not only born during the days of segregation, I lived during the days of segregation up until I was around 10 or 11 years old. During that time, the midwives who had been practicing weren't practicing anymore because they had either gotten too old or they had died. My name is Maria Milton. I am a midwife who practices here in the state of Florida in a small rural community that's called Flowersville, very close to the Alabama state line. My mother was actually recruited to become a midwife because of my birth. Midwives deliver 400 babies a year in these counties. Well trained by the health department, they are licensed by the state. Doctors came to our house looking for somebody who they could train to be one of these midwives. My mother delivered babies for anybody who needed the services because at that particular time, there was not a hospital for even white women to go to, but particularly for black women. I was fortunate enough to work with her, and she was able to show me a lot of the traditional ways of practicing. 
midwives started being stereotyped as being illiterate and incompetent. And that's when a lot of black women started viewing midwives as a step backwards. Out of all the 800 or so babies that I've delivered over these 38 years, I can count the number of black babies that I had, and they don't even total 15. And in fact, I thought at one time about putting a sign out saying, black babies free. Heavenly Father, bless baby Hendrix. Watch over him, protect him, strengthen him. Help him to grow up to be a strong, tall, godly man. In Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus' name, amen. Good afternoon, and thank you all so much for coming. I believe that we are both haunted by the same crime, the crime that is being perpetrated on our children who live in the most dangerous place on this planet in its mother's womb. He kept calling out, stop shooting, stop shooting. We have a pregnant woman, a pregnant sister in here. Pigs kept on shooting. Some call it the silent tragedy, the number of women in America dying from pregnancy or childbirth complications. I look around this room and I see mothers and future mothers. We cherish you. We honor you. Our guest is Harriet Washington. She's been in medical ethics at Harvard Medical School and a senior research scholar at Tuskegee University. Ms. Washington, just for clarification, do you also believe that the most dangerous place for a baby is the womb? Absolutely not. That's a form of saying that the black woman, by virtue of her inferior body or her inferior behavior, puts her child at risk. The danger is living in America. But for black children, it's much more dangerous. Twice as many black children die the first day of their life than in all other developed countries put together. And their mothers fare no better. America is a dangerous place for black children to be, in the womb and out of it. My journey to become a midwife wasn't linear. It was weathering a lot of storms. I went to a school in El Paso, Texas, and I was the only black person in the entire school. A lot of the midwives just didn't want to help me. And so over time, the practice of learning midwifery became in the back seat, where I was just kind of on survival mode. And so around five months, I quit the program. I felt like I was drowning every day. Everybody take a deep breath and allow yourself to see and feel the energy of the ancestors lifting especially on this land, in this place that was a plantation. Many people were enslaved here. Some were hung, others were whipped. A place where a number of people died, but certainly many were born here. All deliveries were done by midwives. Midwives became persecuted by medical establishments as the business of birthing was put more and more in the hands of men who don't have babies, with them giving you drugs, knocking you out, and there was rampant C-sections because of the impatience of doctors, you know, assembly line. Cut this one, cut that one, cut that one, cut that one, get it over with. Birth in the hospital is far too medical. 
whether it's been done by an obstetrician or whether it's been done by a nurse midwife. Both have to work under the rules of the hospital, and sometimes they're forced to do certain things that they probably wouldn't want to do because of hospital rules and regulations. And that's all based on liability, for one thing, and also making money. I don't want anybody dictating to me something based on making money or based on something other than the safety and welfare of these women and their babies. That was one of the reasons why I trained to become a traditional midwife is to keep away from those practices. The first time I ever heard the word epidural was back in the 80s. I mean, it's like, epidural, what? Midwives didn't do that. If you did use a white person as a provider, you got treated differently if you were black. And some of these doctors who took care of you did so in the same way that a human being would do, let's just say, if they found a wounded animal, like a cat or a dog or whatever. That, that was the attitude that these doctors had. They didn't look at you as a human being. Now, they just treated you because you were a life that needed help. When I found out I was pregnant, I was kind of in shock. I always wanted a boy. It changed from being in shock to being excited. He was goofy, <laughs> just like me. <laughs> he laughed a lot, so, and I do too. He could literally just say, Josiah, and he would crack up. <laughs> I didn't put him down. <laughs> I just held him the whole time. I did not have a midwife or a doula during my pregnancy. Did I know it was an option? Yes. Did I get any information about it? No. So I really didn't know how to go about finding a, a doula or a midwife. Josiah was my first high-risk baby. He had three different heart defects. That's why I was high-risk. I broke down crying because I was just so tired of going to the doctors two times a week. It was always a different doctor every time I went. And I would sit there in the waiting room for almost an hour. And then when I get back there, they're like, OK, let's good. See you next week. And that was only uh, one doctor. I had to go to a whole different doctor later on that week. And it was just like, it didn't feel personal. That was kind of a lot, <laughs> especially when you have like other kids and work. It's hard to go to doctors multiple times a week. There's less than 2% of black midwives in the country. And so while there is a resurgence of black midwifery, while there's not enough midwives for people to hire, there's also not enough black midwives to train us. And so many of us are being trained and harmed in predominantly white spaces, like the school that I went to. So we're being met with a lot of racism from preceptors. Most midwives are being underpaid or taking lower fees, sometimes no fee, throughout their career. I've seen that Black midwives that we lost in the last three years. No one really reached their elder years of 80 or 90 and dying of things like cancer, heart disease, and tell that they were just tired in their bodies and was ready to go.
people had to start getting involved politically back in the 1980s because they really wanted to try to stamp out all of the traditional practice in midwives. We had a baby who had a shoulder dystocia. That's a complication where the shoulders come out and get stuck. And they wanted to fault my mother for that birth. And it wasn't her fault. It was just a complication that came up. But the state did use that as an opportunity to try to shut down not only her practice as a midwife, but to try to shut down the birthing center as well. The coroner's report proved that my mother was not at fault. But it did take a lawyer and a lot of money raised to try to help keep her out of that position. During that time, it was very stressful for her. And then later on, she had a heart attack and she didn't practice for a while. But she eventually got her license back, really right before she passed away. Uh, we had had a baby that Monday. And she had gone to the county commissioners that Wednesday trying to get a library open in the community. And then she had a heart attack and died that Thursday. After Josiah was born, I don't really feel like I dealt with uh, postpartum depression or anything. I was just happy to have him. I've always heard of SIDS. With my first, I went to parenting classes and stuff. But once Josiah died and they said the cause of death was SIDS, for me, my understanding is if your baby dies at a certain age, they're just gonna call it SIDS because they did no type of investigation or they just said it was SIDS. That was like my first time riding in the ambulance. For a long time, it was hard to like retrace those steps, like walking outside on my mom's porch, yelling like, come in, Harry, Harry. Like that always played in my mind. Sudden infant death syndrome, or SIDS, is the unclaimed death, usually during sleep of a seemingly healthy baby less than a year old. Black mothers and their babies are at the center of this growing problem. The CDC is saying that impacts black communities at a higher rate than other communities. Do you know what mommy wants to do when she grows up? No. I want to create this really big center where all these families can come to deliver their babies. Like a big house, like this one. And they can have patience and labor for hours and days. And they can have their babies. And then we check up on them at home and see how they're doing. The solutions to the infant and maternal mortality crisis are layered. We can start with giving sovereignty to Black and Indigenous midwives. We can start with giving us reparations to be able to practice in the ways that we see fit for our community, for ourselves, without state surveillance. 
I see more organizations, more spaces that are created by Black midwifery to be fully supported. It's really about sustaining and growing traditional midwifery. The future that I would like to see is that we no longer deal with a crisis of dying in childbirth. No more mothers and pregnant people lost, giving birth, no more babies lost. It's not just survival and it's definitely not death.